Yeah. Could I have the children come for the children's story sermon? <laughs> Well, good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good. Good, good. Wide awake? Yes. yes. Ready for school tomorrow? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Do you have school tomorrow? No. No, I didn't think you did. <laughs> I was kind of, I kind of set you up on that one there. I'm sorry about that. Why don't you have school tomorrow? Do you know? Hmm? Because um, for us, it's not Yeah, it's a, it's a day that we set aside to remember a man named Martin Luther King. Actually, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, Dr. King was a pastor. Did you know that? He was a pastor, and he was very involved in a, in a movement that happened that took place mostly in the 1960s and into the 70s and still continues today, really, called the Civil Rights Movement, where where blacks would be treated the same as white folks would in our society and in our culture. And so because of the important need for that, we have set aside a day that we remember. It's near his birthday. Today actually would be his birthday, January 15th. But we set aside the third Monday in January to remember Dr. King and to remember his legacy and, and who he was. It's an important thing for us to do that, to remember that the color of our skin is not significant to God. It doesn't matter whether our skin is black or brown or white or some other shade in between one of those things. It's important to know, know that Jesus died for all of us. The Bible says there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female. So it doesn't matter whether we're a man or a woman or a boy or a girl. It doesn't matter whether we are black or white or something else. It doesn't matter what country we've been born in or what our circumstances are. Jesus came and died for each of us. And for that, we are very, very grateful. So we're grateful that you're here today and we're grateful that you have today off tomorrow. And I hope that sometime tomorrow you can remember someone like a Dr. King and maybe you can learn a little bit more about him and uh, be inspired to live your life and to make a difference as well in our society. Did you have a question? No? Just have your hand up. Okay. All right. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you this day for who you are. Thank you for the children, for the lessons that we learn about society, about the Bible, about the church, about all the things that impact our lives. And we ask for your blessing to be upon them now. In Jesus we pray. Amen. You may return to your seats. B asked me, she's in the nursery, by the way, this morning. B asked me as we were getting ready to leave today, she said, aren't you taking a jacket with you? And I laughed. I never seem to be able to keep one on. It must be 95 degrees up here on this platform today. Maybe 96. Okay. <laughs> it's warm up here. I'm sorry about that. Uh, but it, it just is what it is. If you have your Bible, turn there to Psalm 139. Psalm 139. As you're turning, I will remind you that the Psalms were the original songbook of both the Old and the New Testaments. Uh, they were written mostly in poetic form. They were written in lyrical fashion so that they could be sung or chanted, as the case might be. And uh, they convey a deep amount of meaning and understanding for us not only because they are beautiful songs, but they are because they are God's word as well. The second most important book in your life ought to be your hymn book. The most important book should be your Bible. 
The second most important book in your life should be your hymn book. For with those two books, you can gather yourself in the Lord's presence and worship him by reading his word and by singing the beautiful hymns of the church and meditating upon God's word. Psalm 139. O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. You have me in behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirits? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise in the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you, for the night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. If only you would slay the wicked, O God. Away from me, you bloodthirsty men. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord, and abhor those who rise up against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. May God's blessing be added to the reading and the hearing of his word. A number of years ago, a college professor was teaching a class on ethics. They were talking about things that were ethical issues or ethical problems, perhaps, in our society. And the professor shared the following scenario. They were talking about the topic of abortion. And he shared the following scenario. So there was a family. where the father had syphilis and the mother had tuberculosis. They had had three children. One of them died in infancy. One of them was born blind. One of them was born with severe handicaps. The mother was pregnant for the fourth time. What should they do? And so he asked this class, since the topic was abortion, what should they do? And so the class uh, consulted together and kind of as a group came up with the decision that they should encourage this mother to have an abortion. And the professor said, you have just aborted Beethoven. Because that was his situation. When Beethoven was born, the family was problematic. Syphilis, tuberculosis, a sibling who was dead, another who was blind, and a third who was severely handicapped. And into that situation, Beethoven was born. This Sunday, the third Sunday in January, is always Sanctity of Life Sunday. 
And I want you to understand how important this issue of abortion is in our society today. In 1973, the United States Supreme Court, in a decision called Roe v. Wade, said that abortion was legal, and it has since then grown in its capacity as well. To where even today, a very late-term abortion is possible in most states. Since 1973, it's estimated that there are between 58 and 59 million babies that have been aborted. 58 and 59 million in the United States. Who have we killed? Have we killed the next Beethoven? Have we killed the scientists who will find the cure for cancer or some other disease? Have we killed a future president? Have we killed the next Billy Graham? Who could lead thousands and millions of people to saving faith in Jesus Christ. We don't know what we've done. I'm here today to tell you that abortion is sinful. Now, if you want to argue with me, you're entitled to do that, and I'll listen to you at least for a little while. And if you want to talk about, well, what if the mother's life is in danger, or what if the mother has been raped, or what if there has been incest, or, you know, I, th that's fine. I, I'm not here to argue that fine detail of that. If a woman has been raped, or has been in an incestual relationship, or if the mother's life is in danger, and they choose to go down that path, I, I'm going to pray God's blessing to be upon them, because obviously it's been traumatic, whatever it is. That's not really what I'm talking about today. What I'm talking about today is the random, incessant abortion of babies as a means of birth control. Abortion as a means of birth control is 100% sinful 100% of the time. The psalmist here, David, writes in Psalm 139, You have known my inmost being. You have knit me together in my mother's womb. That's not just good language, and it's not just poetic language. It's true. Part of the issue with abortion has been, when does life begin? Well, some say life begins at 60. I'm not there yet, but, you know. <laughs> if I live long enough, I'll enjoy it, I'm sure. Or life begins at 21, or at 18, or whatever. Life begins at conception. <clears throat> when the sperm and the egg unite, there's life. How do you know that? How can you know that? You're not a scientist. I'm not a scientist. How do you know that life begins at conception? Because development starts to happen. That's why. A number of years ago, I sat with a mother who had to give birth to a baby who she knew was dead. And how hard that was. Not far long enough to have survived wherever the issue was. It's hard. I've said countless times 
women and men whose wives have undergone an abortion and the guilt never seems to leave even though it may have been 10 or 20 or 30 or even 40 years ago when that occurred. You have known me in my inmost being. You have known me in my mother's womb. You have knit me together. I like that phrase. <clears throat> All of us seem to be somewhat caught up on Facebook today and you see things there and you respond to people's photographs and, and some of them are sad and some of them are funny and some of them you say, oh gosh, glad it wasn't me. <laughs> Saw a picture the other day of uh, a pair of crocheted shorts and it said, just because you can crochet doesn't mean you should. <laughs> Crocheting and knitting. Yeah, you see where my mind is. Yeah. You have knit me in my inmost being. Jeremiah, the great prophet, the last one before Israel and Judah fall, says in chapter 1 of his great prophecy that God had appointed him to be prophet while he was still in his mother's womb. He has known it all the days of his life. I grew up in a Christian home. Mom and dad were believers long before I was born into the family. Long before my brothers were born into the family. We went to church, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, during revival services, if we had a missionary conference, whenever the doors of the church were opened, we went, with the possible exception of when someone was cleaning, although even then sometimes we went. I asked Jesus to be my Savior and Lord when I was 11. A few years later, when I was 18 and turning 19 years old, I began to understand my call to ministry. It took a long time, and it's a long story, and I won't repeat it. Most of you have heard me speak of it in the past. But when it finally realized that God was calling me into ministry, it was kind of like the light bulb that went on, and hello, hello. <laughs> Why didn't I see this before? And so I began looking as to where I wanted to go to college. And I, I didn't know much about Christian colleges. I had not researched them at all before. I, I had planned on going to college. I'd been accepted at Harvard University. But I wasn't going to go there to study for the ministry. I couldn't afford to go there, period. And so in the process of my search, I, I became acquainted with Finley College, which is our denominational school. So you would have thought I would have known about it, but the Windsor Church was a bit different than anybody else. And so I didn't know about Finley College. And one of the things that I had to do before enrolling at Finley College was I had to have a physical. And so I called our family doctor and set up an appointment to go for a physical. And I've known this doctor all my life. He delivered me when my mom was in labor. He delivered my brothers. He delivered me back in the day. You know, family doctors were truly family doctors. They took care of you from stem to stern, so to speak. And as I'm sitting there in Dr. Dellinger's office, telling him that I'm going 
to Finley College and then I'm going to study to be a pastor. He said, well, that's no surprise. And I said, really? And he said, yeah, I've known that since the day you were born. And I said, really? And he said, yeah. Didn't anyone ever tell you? And I said, no. He said, you know, back when you were born, Michael, we didn't know whether the woman was carrying a boy or a girl. Sometimes we didn't know whether you were one or two, as in the case with my brothers. Mom thought she was having one. Lord blessed her with two. He said, on the day you were born, he said, I, I was there and I was... You were born, I, I said to your mother, Bernice, the Lord has uh, given you another son. She, she wanted, by the way, twin daughters. I don't know what was wrong with that woman. <laughs> she thought twins were easier to care for than one. And she may have been right about that, you know, after I came into the picture. <laughs> And he's telling me this, and he looked at me and he said, on the day you were born, when I shared with your mother that the Lord has given you another healthy son, her response was this, Lord, I'm not sure why you have given me a son, but I give him to you this day. Here I am. A million miles and a few years later. <laughs> we have a problem in our society. We want to say we are one nation under God. And we are not. We want to condemn Barack Obama when he says we are not a Christian nation. He's right. We should be. We can be. We ought to be. But we are not. When we have aborted 58 or 59 million babies legally since 1973. I'm not sure how we can ever consider ourselves to be a Christian nation or one nation under God. Twice in scripture, the murder of innocence is condemned. The first time is when Moses is born while the Israelites are in captivity in Egypt and Moses' mother becomes pregnant and, and, and Pharaoh has issued an edict that all the male children who were born needed to be put to death because the Israelites were growing larger in number than what the Egyptians were. And so the, the edict is issued that all of the male Hebrew children should be killed. And when Moses is born, his mother can't stand that. And so she hides him. She cares for him until he, he's, he's grown large enough that she didn't know what to do. And so God gives her this idea. She knows where Pharaoh's daughter goes to take a bath every day in the Nile River. And so she makes this little ark. And she covers it with pitch inside and out, and she hides her baby in it and puts it there in the bulrushes. And when Pharaoh's daughter comes, she discovers the child and raises it as her own. She needs a wet nurse, and so guess who gets to be the wet nurse? Mom. He goes on to be the 
great leader of Israel. A man who goes up onto the mountain of God and, and speaks face to face with God. A man who receives the Ten Commandments from God's hand. A man who leads a stubborn and obstinate nation of, of people through the Red Sea and across the desert and to the brink of the Promised Land. And God condemns the murder of those innocent children in Egypt. And a thousand plus years later, a baby is born in Bethlehem. And some wise men come. Some magi. To worship. And they stop in Jerusalem and they inquire of Herod the Great, where is the one who was born the king of the Jews? And Herod says, I know what you're talking about, but when you find him, let me know. Being warned in a dream, the Magi leave and go a different direction, but Herod knows that it's in Bethlehem where Jesus has been born. And so he issues a decree that all of the male children two years of age and under should be killed. God condemns the murder of the innocents. I'm here to talk to you today about the sanctity of human life. The fact that abortion is wrong, but I'm not here just to talk about abortion. I'm here to talk to you about the fact that life is precious. When was the last time you turned on the local news that you didn't hear about a shooting or a stabbing or some issue of domestic violence in Harrisburg or Carlisle or York or Lancaster or Chambersburg? Life is precious from the moment of conception until the moment when we draw our last breath. Life is precious. On September 11, 2001, two airplanes flew into the World Trade Center. Another flew into the Pentagon and one crash landed in western Pennsylvania maybe heading for Washington, D.C., for the White House or the Capitol, who knows? Acts of terrorism, and we've seen it more recently than that with the bombing in Boston. The bus and the trucks that driven into crowds of people in Paris and in Brussels, recently in Jerusalem. The killing of people in a nightclub in Orlando. Life is precious. Why? Because God has made us. We are knit in our mother's womb by God. We are of him. As human beings, we are the only part of creation that is created in his image. There's no plant that's created in the image of God. There's no animal that's created in the image of God. Only humankind is created in the image of God. We are precious in his sight. This morning when I had the children up here, We talked for just a brief moment about a man named Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It didn't matter what color his skin is. It didn't matter where he was born. It didn't matter any of those things. We make those things matter. 
As a kid growing up in the Cold War, I knew that Russians were my enemies. I'd never met a Russian. But I knew they were my enemies. I remember the first time I met someone from Russia who was a strong evangelical Christian. <laughs> How could this be my enemy? This is my brother. Life is precious. If we want our nation to be different, it starts with me and it starts with you. We can't put the blame of responsibility on somebody else. It falls here at my feet and at yours. Life is precious. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you this day for who you are. Thank you for the love that you have shown us through your son, Jesus, who came and dwelt among us, who has become flesh to be like us, who has laid down his life on the cross for us, who's borne our penalty of sin. O oh Lord, this day, be first in our life that we might live in relationship with you. In Jesus we pray. Amen.